Hello and welcome to the program today. I'm Layo or Larinde. We begin in Cameroon where soldiers say they have freed a kidnapped senator of the ruling party plus several other hostages in an operation in the country's English-speaking northwest region. The army says Senator Elizabeth Regina Mundi was kidnapped along with her driver last month in Bamenda. The separatist group and Bazonian Defense Forces ADF said it carried out that abduction. The rebel group is one of several fighting for independence in the two main Anglophone regions, the Northwest and the Southwest. Well, in a statement, the army's spokesperson, Cyril Guemo, said a dozen separatist fighters were killed, many left injured, while others fled during the night raid. South Africa's Hauteng Health Department is investigating the cause of a fire at a hospital in the capital, Pretoria, early on Monday morning. Well, the South African government said in a statement there were no patients or staff casualties from the fire that affected temporary structures at the Steve Biko Hospital. The government said that 18 patients and one body had to be moved to other areas of the hospital as a safety precaution. The cause of the fire is unknown and an investigation is underway even as the fire has been put out. Well, this fire is the third of such incidents in a hospital since last year. Nearly 700 patients were evacuated in April last year from Charlotte Hospital in Johannesburg following a blaze prompting the hospital to be closed for a week. South Africa's unemployment rate has decreased by 0.8% to 34.5% in the first quarter of 2022, the first time since 2020. According to Statistics South Africa, the biggest job gains were recorded in community and social services, manufacturing and trading. The youth aged 15 to 24 and 25 to 34 recorded the highest unemployment rates of 63.9% and 42.1%. Also, the black African and colored population groups remain vulnerable in the labor market. Let us look in terms of uh, uh, employment. The number of those that are employed has increased from the fourth quarter of 2021 by 370,000. And in this regard, we see a lot more increases in the community and social services by 281,000. And we see an increase again in terms of manufacturing by about uh, 263,000. And we see an increase again in terms of trade by about 98,000. And of course, there were decreases in other areas like construction, um, in terms of uh, private households and them. And in this regard, that increase of 370,000 uh, in total, when we have done the additions and the subtractions, brings us to about 14.9 million people or, uh, that are employed as in the first quarter of 2022. Sudanese authorities have released 125 political prisoners after the country's military leader lifted the state of emergency on Sunday. They are leaders of the resistance committees who oppose the military coup after months of unlawful detention. The Sudanese lawyers group said the activists were released from prisons in the capital Khartoum, Port Sudan and Rabak in the southeast region. Their release comes after General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan lifted the state of emergency that, impo that he imposed across the country after seizing power in a military coup last October. The resistance committee's grassroots groups have been spearheading anti-military protests in the country ever since. The mass street protests are calling for the military to quit politics and they've been going on regularly for more than seven months since the coup. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi is playing host to his Polish counterpart, President Andrzej Duda, in Cairo. The North African leader is hosting him for a three-day state visit. 
Topics on the agenda include strengthening economic and scientific cooperation, as well as the next UN summit on climate that's scheduled in November in the Egyptian city of Sham El Sheikh. Now, during a joint press conference, the Polish head of state also promoted his country's potential to export crops. Egypt buys around 60% of its wheat from Ukraine and Russia and now wishes to diversify its sources of supply. Andrew Duda backs uh, EU negotiations with Egypt also to fill the gap in gas supply. African energy producers have received much attention from the EU since the war in Ukraine erupted, or to mark the launching of what both leaders wish to be a new era of bilateral relations. Poland is resuming its direct flights of the national airline between Cairo and Warsaw. The VOA's correspondent in Cairo, Egypt, Edward Yeranian, joins us now. Hello, Edward. Thank you for speaking to us. My pleasure, Liam. Well, talk to us about the meeting between President uh, Fatah al-Sisi and Polish President Andrzej Duda on Monday. Well, both countries uh, have very important mutual interests at this point in time. Uh, Poland has not sent a leader to visit Egypt since the first, uh, the beginning of its independence uh, after the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, the, it, its pre first president after that happened uh, was the last president, uh, Lech Walesa, to, to visit Egypt. Um, so clearly they're expressing more interest. Uh, Egypt, uh, for its part, is concerned about uh, wheat prices uh, and Poland uh, is sort of playing broker for Ukraine, uh, which would like to export its wheat, but can't get it out of the Black Sea. So I guess Poland is going to try to export some of it. Uh, Egypt needs to play a very, uh, very careful game here because it has close ties with Russia as well. And it buys more wheat from Russia than it does from Ukraine. So uh, that needs to be considered. And also uh, Poland and other European countries are interested in buying Egyptian liquid natural gas. Uh, and Egypt, of course, would like to sell that. So a lot of interest in common at, at this point in time. So, so what are the plans uh, of EU? What is Egypt's plan? Since the Ukraine war, we know Egypt, like many other countries, have been affected, especially with wheat imports, you know, just like you've mentioned. Well, President Sisi says, you know, he wants to diversify the sources. So what are, what are the plans? Well, Egypt is saying that it has enough wheat uh, at least until the end of the year. Uh, we've seen periods in time over the last 10 years that uh, I've watched this uh, where we've had less wheat in stock than that. Um, God only knows if the ports on the Black Sea will be operating uh, by the end of the year. Uh, perhaps not. Uh, and Egypt has announced uh, a number of agricultural product projects on its own soil uh, that would increase wheat production as well as uh, other other um, things like soy and corn and uh, various uh, agricultural vegetables and things like that. Uh, so it's hoping to uh, tackle that problem locally as well as internationally. Uh, and, and God only knows. I mean, countries often put on a, a very positive face and uh, things turn out to be worse than they predicted. Who knows? I, I'm not sure. But Egypt, uh, by my experience in the 15 years I've been here, uh, has usually muddled through previous crises. So I'm not necessarily sure this is going to be worse than others. And on a lighter note, Edward, Poland is set to resume, you know, direct flights from Warsaw to Cairo. What has been the reaction to this? Uh, well, Russia and Ukraine have been traditional um, I don't want to say exporters, but have been uh, countries that send a lot of tourists to Egypt. So uh, some of those tourists will, are, are not coming, um, maybe many of them, if not most. Uh, so obviously, if Poland can fill the gap, that would be appreciated uh, here in Egypt. 
Um, also, uh, given the end sort of uh, tapering off of the COVID-19 crisis, Egypt seems to be doing pretty well right at this point, at least here in Cairo, uh, in terms of uh, tourists. So I don't, I don't notice that there's a tourist problem. We, we seem to have more tourists than, than in quite a long time. But of course, uh, many of the Russian and Ukrainian tourists used to go to the, uh, the Red Sea, uh, Sharm el Sheikh. So perhaps that would be a destination for the Polish tourists. All right, then, Edward Yaranian, VOA's correspondent in Cairo. Thank you. My pleasure, Lyle. Well, Egypt has unveiled a major finding of 250 sealed coffins containing mummies, 150 bronze statues of ancient gods and goddesses and other antiquities at the Saqqara necropolis south of the capital, Cairo. This Egyptian archaeology, there's an Egyptian archaeological mission that's working in Bubastian Cemetery area that discovered the bronze statues in the site that dates back to the late period of ancient Egypt. Well, the catch includes 150 different sized bronze statues of gods and goddesses. The mission has discovered 250 intact colored wooden coffins that date back to 500 BC. Inside several burial wells comprising well-preserved mummies, as well as a group of golden face wooden statues, painted wooden boxes and amulets. The Chinese-built standard gauge railway is helping power, to power Kenya's economic growth and by transporting its goods and people between the coastal port city of Mombasa and the capital Nairobi since launching exactly five years ago. The Mombasa Nairobi SGR, mainly financed by China and constructed by the Road and Bridge Corporation, began con construction in 2014 and was put into operation on May 31st, 2017. Well, since its launch, the railway is said to have handled close to 7.8 million passenger trips and shuttled over 1.7 million along its routes. It's comfortable and I love it compared to other means like road. It's faster, there's less delay and it's timely and it's amazing. I like the scenery on the way. On a beautiful day you can be able to see various animals. Uh, SDR is very convenient and it has been very helpful for the students, for working people and for business people because it saves a lot of time. We've been able to save almost up to 25% in transport costs um by using just the sgr truck drivers are usually allowed up to 50 kilos loss per drive per truck but with uh, using the sgr we've been able to commit that no grain will be lost the old meter grid radio had a lot of limitations in terms of transit time and by road you know it's quite expensive arrival of sgr was very very welcome it, it eased all these challenges that we faced. It lowered the cost of movement of goods and services. It provided enough security and safety for cargo moving from Mombasa to the inland destination. A positive impact in the economy. One, Kenya Railways originally used to move 4% of cargo from the port throughput. We are now at almost 40% of port throughput. I look at the SGR or serving the region. The region, I mean the East African region. What it means is that the economy now will be relying on the SGR. And therefore, we expect that the almost 200 million population within that region, within the regional partner states, will benefit from this. Still ahead on the program. Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo's presidents hold talks amid tensions between both countries. Please stay with us. Millions of people living together in one community, working together in the same trade. We go into their myths, find out how they live and work. Oh my goodness, food business is not an easy business. I spent more than 35 years for this community. We tell these stories and how to survive in this economy. Community Report, we tell your story.
Our website, ChannelsTV.com, has more information on our top stories and others. Subscribe and watch Channels Television's live stream on YouTube and other social media platforms using your mobile device browser. Or download the Channels TV app for Android and iOS devices from their respective stores. You can also watch us via your smart TV platforms on Apple TV, Android TV, Fire TV, and Roku. Channels Television, ubiquitous. Welcome back to the program. In a bid to help address air pollution, researchers at Uganda's Makerere University have built a low-cost air quality monitor, the AirQ. This has a network of over 80 monitors across the country that use cloud-based technology, machine learning and artificial intelligence to collect, analyze, predict and also to raise awareness about air quality. A Ugandan team of university researchers has developed a low-cost air quality monitoring technology solution that is designed to work in an environment with conditions like extreme heat, dust and unreliable power supply unique to Africa. Engineer Beno Mugisha, who leads the research project called AirCool at the state-run Makariri University, say they were driven to develop the innovation as a contribution to tackling the high death toll from air pollution. The World Health Organization estimates globally 7 million people die annually from illnesses related to air pollution exposure. Air pollution is one of the greatest uh, environmental health risks. Uh, we quickly found out that uh, organizations like the World Health Organization had uh, done some studies to quantify the magnitude of air pollution, uh, which shows that uh, over 7 million people die every year uh, from uh, illnesses which are linked to air pollution exposure and for us that was you know really um, an eye-opener for us to come in with technology solutions and how we could contribute to improving air quality according to the 2021 world air quality report Uganda's capital Kampala was ranked amongst the world's most polluted cities with pollution levels that exceed WHO safe standards by five to seven times. Major sources of pollutants in Kampala, according to the country's environmental protection body, include dust from unpaved roads, wood fuel use, vehicle and industrial emissions, and open burning of solid waste. The monitoring devices are installed at locations like schools, residential areas, streets and buildings, as well as motorbike taxis. Technology also deploys artificial intelligence and machine learning to analyze data, boost accuracy of monitor readings, make forecasts, and troubleshoot errors. Currently, AirQ has developed a network of 65 monitors, mostly in Kampala. According to the AirCo, their devices, about $150 apiece, are designed to work on both grid electricity and solar power. Collins Masigwe, a public health specialist at World Health Organization, says the low cost of air cues technology and its suitability for African conditions were a boost to Uganda's efforts to improve its air monitoring capacity. The only caveat there would be, does it measure the same way as other standardized equipment? So, so standardizing it and, and making sure it does the same job as other equipment would be required. And then if it does the same job, I bet it will be the best that you can have for air quality monitoring. And then we'll expand our air quality monitoring. And I believe the resultant will be more awareness, more uh, efforts for policy, and then efforts for controlling air pollution will be, I think, established from individual level to the public level. The researchers say the devices are also uniquely designed to withstand the environmental and physical conditions, including dust and humidity, while reliably operating in settings characterized by unreliable power and intermittent internet connectivity, typical of sub-Saharan Africa. 
Rwanda's President Paul Kagame has spoken with his Democratic Republic of Congo counterpart Felix Shisekedi, along with the African Union Chairman Macky Sall amid the cross-border tensions. President Macky Sall of Senegal encouraged Angolan President Jao Lorenko to continue mediating on the issue on the Regional International Conference on the Great Lakes region. Mr. Saul had earlier expressed his concerns at the rising tensions between the two countries, appealing for dialogue to resolve the dispute. The Kinshasa government accuses Rwanda of supporting the M23 rebels in renewed fighting in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. However, the Rwandan government has denied this. Thousands of people have fled their homes as the Congolese army battles the rebels in North Kivu province. Last week, DR Congo suspended flights to Rwanda and summoned Kigali's ambassador over the matter. In the meantime, rebels in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo have retreated from areas they recently captured in clashes with government forces in North Kivu province. The fighting there has displayed displaced more than 100,000 people in the province, but local media reports that many locals are now returning to their homes in the different areas. Ex spokesperson for the M23 rebels, Major William Goma, said that they've left those areas in order to make peace. The rebels had advanced about 20 kilometers from the provincial capital, Goma, it's not clear, however, where they retreated to, but the UN-sponsored radio Opai reports that they went to positions close to the border with Rwanda. On Monday, government spokesperson Patrick Muyaya had ruled out the possibility of talks with the rebels, terming them terrorists. But the rebel spokesperson said the designation of M23 as a terrorist group made no difference. Of the many small groups of local filmmakers in the UAE, Dubai-based Nigerian filmmaker Ikena Chianumba has taken up the challenge to create a community for like minds. Well, he speaks with Channels Television's Dubai correspondent Mayowa Degoki about the local film scene and much more. Hollywood's interest in Dubai, which began in 2017 following the release of Ebony Life's Wedding Party 2, is growing, albeit slowly. In 2021, director Adekunle Adejuigbe screened his award-winning action thriller, The Delivery Boy, while Funke Akindele premiered at Omogeto the Saga in UAE cinemas, the first Nollywood production to achieve the feat. The same year, Ebony Live Films' Chief Daddy 2 was partly shot in Dubai with support from the government. Since then, resident movie buffs and film practitioners see the need to form a community and build a local industry. So you have theater groups here and there. There is one in Abu Dhabi, there are a few here in Dubai that I've gone to a few times. You know, so there are theater groups or small groups here and there, but there is not, there's not really a big community that brings uh, uh, people together. Budding filmmaker Ikena Chianumba is passionate about seeing such a community spring up. His love for Nollywood dates back many years when he started modeling and attending auditions for film. I wanted something that would pay me good money at the end of every month. Uh, so I was not that patient to wait for climbing the ladder and acting, you know, because I actually went to a lot of auditions in the Kija. I remember Alan Days. I remember a lot of people I did audition with now that are, uh, are big movie stars now. Emeko Koye, for example, I met him at an audition, and I was a good producer, you know. Uh, also Amara, Nachi, and Daniel K. Daniel was my university. Uh, classmates uh, all through school and I did auditions those, those time but I was not patient you know because the movie industry in Nigeria you need to be patient 
uh, to climb the ladder and make it big. So I decided to go professional. 15 years in the corporate world as a marketing executive, Ikena finally made his return to Nollywood in 2018 as executive producer of Couple of Temptations and Sweet Revenge, which he also featured in as an actor. A woman who is two years older than he is, not at all about 20. Having got a taste of success, he went ahead to direct his first project in Dubai, a short film, Just a Delivery Guy. I really need a guy like you, and this is something that you deserve. Sir. Produced and shot within 48 hours, Just a Delivery Guy is a tribute to delivery riders who form an integral part of the e-commerce system in the UAE. I wanted to showcase their story and give them like a, uh, give like a, a, a platform for them to be heard, for people to pay more attention to their delivery guys. Because in Dubai, we buy a lot of stuff. There's a lot of e-commerce. There's a lot of businesses thriving in Dubai. And these businesses thrive around people that get the products to you. A lot of us will get the products, we don't care about how the products came, but we're satisfied that the product is there. But there's a lot of back end to it. The film, which won the best debut entry at the Theme 8 Film Festival in Dubai, also premiered at a private event organized by his wife, who produced the film. A lot of things have kind of come after that, like people are interested in doing film with us, actors, filmmakers, they are able to see the story we created, so they want to know what else we have for them. So I'm very, very excited about what we have in the future coming. Ikenna says he has plans to create more films in Dubai and hopes his efforts will contribute to what may someday become a Middle East extension of Nollywood. And that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Olamide.